Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Hello. Hi. Welcome Hi. to the new webinar. Welcome, Ernest, to the new webinar. We start the session of today. Yes, we will wait some seconds as usual because the participants are arriving to the meeting room. The number is growing fast. Then, uh, yeah, it's 301. Then we will start the webinar of today. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Sara Bazat. I'm a researcher of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, but also the lead scientist of the WMO Barcelona the Regional Center, that is the institution that is uh, organizing these events. Uh, and with me today for chairing the session is Ernest Werner, that is the technical director of the Barcelona the Regional Center. And before to start the webinar, I will introduce you a little bit the platform, even if all of you probably will know about the Zoom. This is a Zoom webinars uh, option. And then this means that you as attendees, you don't have direct access to the panelists, meaning the speakers, then for asking questions and for, for uh, writing us and contacting us, you have two options in the bottom of your screen, that is the chat and the questions and answers box, that is this Q&A uh, bottom, where you can put your question during the webinar. Please don't wait until the end to type all your questions because it's more difficult for us for handling uh, the questions to launch to the speakers of today. And a uh, few less things to do about the platform. And uh, because, and let's arrive a little bit late today. I will do my uh, myself introduction of the speakers. Mm. No worries. I am prepared. We are prepared for that, for any contingen contingency. And then uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers of today. We have two excellent researchers from the other side of the Atlantic, is Andrea Silly and Ashford Reyes. They are researchers at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. Thanks, uh, Andrea, for giving me the tip in the back. And uh, today, uh, they are very active researchers in the DAST uh, community because they are really working with observations and, and models for predicting Saharan dust intrusions to the other side of the Atlantic, for example, and their impacts in different sectors. And today they will introduce all the activities of the Caribbean Institute. And also I want to mention that Andrea, Andrea Silly, is, is the chair of the regional steering group of the Pan-American Node of the SDS WOST, this WMO World Meteorological Organization initiative that is searching to provide uh, capacity building and uh, products to different user communities. And it's my pleasure that uh, they they accept the, the invitation to these webinars. And um, with this, just I want to thank again that you accept the invitation and the floor is yours, Andrea and Ashford. You can start with the talk about the Caribbean Institute. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Do you want us to introduce ourselves a little bit too? couple of things or a minute or two? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Please. Sure. Okay, I'll introduce myself a bit and then I'll let Ashford do that. And then I'll go ahead and share the screen and start the talk. And as Sarah said, I'm Andrea Seeley from the CIMH. I am the chair of WMO SDS was Pan American Regional Steering Group. And I'm a meteorologist at the CIMH, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. I also lecture at the University of the West Indies KFL campus in meteorology, and also I'm an instructor at the CIMH because we are a WMO regional training center. I also teach courses at the CIMH as well. Um, so I'll let Ashford introduce himself and then I'll go ahead and get started. You can go ahead, Ash. All right, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, my name is Ashford Rez. I'm also a meteorologist at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. I also lecture meteorology courses both at the University of the West Indies and at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. I mainly specialize in numerical weather prediction, radar meteorology, and I do intra-physical meteorology and intra-dynamic meteorology. And 
observa instrument observations and, and basic weather analysis and stuff. Those are the subjects I mainly teach. And my primary role at the institute, uh, research-wise, is doing modeling. That is basically a love of mine. So I do both um, traditional weather modeling using the WRF, NMM core, ARW core. And I also do wolf chem modeling to do the dust and air quality modeling for Andrea. So this is basically how I actually fit in to the, into this group, you know, because of the modeling aspect. So thank you. Thanks a lot for your, your self-introduction. <laughs> it was Thanks. nice. And now okay. I think that we can start with the webinar. Uh, yes. We switch off our camera just for giving you more visual visual visibility. Sorry. No problem. And I will warn you when there will be the time to to finish. Okay. Okay. You're great. Like forty minutes from now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You can see the PowerPoint presentation. Yep, perfect. Yep. Great. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And um, basically, I want to say thanks again for inviting us to do this. And I really felt that it would not be complete if I did not have Ashford presenting with me because of the work that he does that really is the foundation behind a lot of what the Pan American Center is doing and, and, and is aiming to continue doing. So I just want to talk about the CIMH activities related to dust impacts in the Caribbean. You will see some overlap with air quality as well, because as you would well know, in terms of the Saharan dust impacts, you know, impacting air quality is one of those things, among others. So you're going to see some overlap with the air quality work we do, um, but a lot of it is still focused on Saharan dust, a lot of what we still do in terms of the Pan American um, center and related activities. But because of the, the nature of the audience we have, they, I know there are going to be many who are not familiar with CIMH as an institution. So what I'm going to do is firstly give an outline of what who we are, what we do, a bit about our mandate and structure, and then I will go into the activities, the general air quality dust activities, and then Ashford is going to talk about the modeling, and then we'll close off the presentation. So basically, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, which I will refer to as CIMH, is an institution of the Caribbean community, CARICOM. It is the technical organ of the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, which is the CMO, and it is an affiliate of the University of the West Indies. And the mandate of the CIMH is to assist in improving and developing the meteorological and hydrological services, as well as providing the awareness of the benefits of meteorology and hydrology for the economic well being of the 16 CMO member states. And we achieve this through training, research, investigations, and the provision of related specialized services and advice. So, about the Caribbean Meteorological Organization that I just mentioned, the CMO. So, there are various organs there's the Caribbean Meteorological Council. There's the Caribbean Meteorological Organization Headquarters Unit. There is the CIMH, where we work. And then there's the Caribbean Meteorological Foundation, which hasn't functioned for many years. So the objective of the CMO is that the organization shall have as its objectives the promotion and coordination of regional activities in the field of meteorology and allied sciences. So in terms of the functions of the CMO, we provide, the CMO, I should say, provides meteorological services to civil aviation, among many other things, cooperating with other services to provide efficient hurricane warning systems, providing meteorological information and advice to member states, collecting and analysis and analyzing all relevant MET data available, publishing those results, cooperating with the MET services, executing basic scientific observations that keep, are, are keeping within the objectives, participating in the work of 
the appropriate international orga organizations such as the WMO and ICAO participating in work in applied meteorology, agricultural met hydro hydrology, and the associated research that would be of direct interest to our region and cooperating with all the relevant scientific institutions as necessary. So the membership of the CMO is 16 member states, Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, where CIMH is actually based physically, Belize, the British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago and the Turks and Caicos Islands. So this is the membership. But of course, we collaborate with many other territories in the Caribbean as well. And of course, regional and internationally, um, other countries as well. But this is the membership, official membership of the CM. So in terms of the functions of the CIMH, we are WMO Regional Training Center and RTC. So we train various categories of meteorological and hydrological personnel. We operate as a center of research in meteorology, hydrology, and associated sciences. We're also a regional climate data center. We're also a WMO regional instrument center. We're also a regional center of excellence for training in satellite meteorology. And we are also a WMO designated regional climate center for the Caribbean. We also have a center for climate and environmental simulations, a center dealing with water resources, hydrology, geoscience, and earth observation applications. We host the WMO Pan American Center for the WMO SDS was. We are Regional Marine uh, Forecasting Support Center. We are an advisor to regional governments on matters related to meteorology, climate, and hydrology. And we also provide specialized services to industry. So to go on more to why air quality and the focus on Saharan dust. So this is something that we, it is a newer topic for us, a newer portfolio, as in probably I would say less than 10 years old. That's why I say new because we were founded, the CIMH was started in 1967. So the, the focus and, on air quality in Saharan dust is a fairly new topic compared to how long we were existing. Um, but there, there is good motivation for why this is something we've added to our portfolio in terms of what we do, because we cover so many other things in terms of weather climate um, that it felt natural to actually also include air quality. And the motivation behind this is that air quality has become a major issue in the Caribbean. It is a major, it has been a major issue other places, but also in the Caribbean region. I know people think about islands, they think about islands being pristine, but we do have our air quality issues. And things like urban development, um, building infrastructure, more infrastructure, increased vehicle emissions. A lot of our islands, Barbados for sure, we have a lot of cars, we have a lot of vehicles, especially compared to the size of the island and the population. And then there's also growing industrialization as well. And what people, what we, what many on this um, webinar and this audience will be familiar with is that Significant amounts of Saharan dust travel across the Northern tropical Atlantic to the Caribbean every year. And those incursions also degrade our air quality. The concentrations in the Caribbean often exceed the US EPA standards for PM 2.5. And this has serious implications for human health in the region. Also several territories in the Caribbean do not have routine air quality management uh, monitoring programs. And there is also a lack of enforcement of air quality standards for PM 2.5 and PM 10. And, and the, la the standards may be on the books um, in some cases, but they're not enforced. So what we did at CAMH was to take the initiative to provide regional dust and air quality forecasts for the Caribbean using the wharf Ken. And Ashford will talk more about that. So among the activities we have, well, we've heard as we've heard it said um, more than once, we host the Pan American Center for the WMO Sun and Dust Storm Warning Advisory and Assessment System, SDS was. And, and some of the things, among the things we look to do would be to develop, refine, and distribute to the global community the products that are useful in reducing the adverse impacts of sun and dust storms. And secondly, to assess the impacts of sun and dust storms, sun and dust storm processes on society, the environment, and nature. 
Another activity we have been very involved in is the Caribbean Aerosol Health Network. And there is big overlap in, in this network with the SDS was. Um, the, the CAN, the Caribbean Aerosol Health Network, was co-founded by Professors Olga Mayol. At that time, Olga would have been at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Pedras. She's now at the Brookhaven National Lab. And Professor Americus Joel Prospero from University of Miami. They co-founded this network, and we have been a very um, involved participant in this network as well. And basically, CAN looks at improving our understanding of the impacts um, of atmospheric particulate matter on the Caribbean region. A lot of the focus is on dust, but we want to look at particulate matter as well in general. So the impacts on climate, weather, ecosystems, air quality, visibility, and health. And this is towards developing a coordinated regional in an international effort on atmospheric particulate measurements in the Caribbean, especially Africa and dust. Because as we know, there are studies that looked at the fact that the PM10 is exceeded at a rate comparable to major urban areas in Europe and the US because of African dust impact in our region. So among some of the activities that we would have, uh, we would have helped with or we would have been involved with and will continue to be involved with, uh, periodically there is a School of Atmospheric Measurements in Latin America and the Caribbean that is offered. Uh, we were co-sponsor of that in 2018 and that was held in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And among the things that this school was looking at, this workshop would have um, aimed to do would be to improve regional capacity and stimulate the development of aerosol and reactive gases monitoring programs, both regional and national, that can contribute their data to regional and international projects and networks. Things like fostering the building of a community of atmospheric scientists in the Latin American and Caribbean region, um, educating early career scientists from our region, Latin America and the Caribbean, on global and regional aspects of atmospheric composition change, atmospheric composition monitoring, and also promoting best practices of open data sharing and open access publication within Latin America and the Caribbean region. Another activity that was a big activity for us under CAN and also overlapped with SDS was we were a part of the field campaign, the summer intensive field campaign uh, from the Kalima PH project, the Caribbean Air Quality Alert and Management Assist Assistance System Public Health. Um, the field campaign was coordinated by uh, Olga when she was still at Olga Mayol, when she was still at UPR, Rio Piedras, and our aerosols and dust team, which would have been myself, Ashford Reyes, and Rebecca Chuet Lucas, who's one of our, who's our research officer, we provided daily weather and dust briefings from June to August of both 2020 and 2021. The overall project, one of the other, the culprit, one of the principal investigators um, who I haven't mentioned here, but I will mention now, uh, Pablo Mendez Lazaro from the University of Puerto Rico. He is also a principal investigator along with Olga of that project um, because there is a public health component. We participated in the, as I mentioned, the summer intensive field campaign, and it was a really, it was a really rewarding experience because in 2020, when we were uh, doing that campaign, the Godzilla event, our mega dust event, our historic mega dust event in this region actually occurred. So we actually had a prime opportunity to actually do some sampling, to do the, the dust briefings, the dust forecast for that event and analyze that event as part of this project. <clears throat> Another activity that we have been very involved in um, would be the Saharan dust advisories for the Caribbean community health sector. So what we do every year during the season when you are going to get a lot of dust transport. So let's say from spring, late spring into summer, we would actually send out an advisory to the Caribbean Public Health Agency and the Pan American Health Organization for distribution to their networks. And our team, uh, myself, Ashford, Rebecca, and Dr. David Farrell, who's the principal of CMH, we would put together these advisories. And we would, improve, we would include comprehensive information on these advisories, things such as 
of course, the forecast for the dust um, concentration, um, the surface PM 2.5, the PM 10 concentration. And we would also uh, give an idea, depending on if there's any significant weather in the area as well, we would include that. We would also include any photos um, to give an idea, especially if it's a heavy dust event, to show the visibility, show that you can actually see that there's a dust incursion. And we would also include things like implications for respiratory illness, just a little bit, because we expect that the health people would take that information and they would add more to it because they're the, the medical and health experts. Um, so we would include that kind of information and of course the contact information and where we would be, how we would be providing updates and if we would be providing updates, depending on the length of time that we expect to be impacted by a dust incursion. And uh, we found that these were fairly well received, um, may not always have been widely distributed, but um, they were well received and we look forward to doing this more in the future. And it really does overlap very well with what we are mandate as um, a part of the SDS was initiative. Another um, set of advisories we've sent that were very well received and were very useful were Saharan dust advisories for the Caribbean community energy sector. When we, pro when we produce these advisories, we would actually include the information now suited to the energy sector. So information, once again, we would give the dust forecast because they would need to know, especially for those in the, who have the people, who have the employees working outside, um, things like the particulate matter concentrations, dust concentrations. And then we would also include things like LIDAR um, information. We would include aerosol optical depth because um, the, the energy sector did ask for AOD information as well, the AOD forecast. So that is something we would have provided that was additional to what we would have sent the health sector. Um, the, AOD, the AOD data that we would have gotten from Euronet, the AOD forecast, as I said, and another important thing for the energy sector would have been radiation measurements. So the pyranometer measurements taken at the Barbados Cloud Observatory in Debo's Point, uh, which is right next to Ragged Point, where we have the, the dust measurements from University of Miami, we also would send that information. So that irradiance information was very important for them as well. <clears throat> and when we send out the energy sector advisories, we would send this to the CARICOM Regional Task Force on Climate Resilient Energy Supplies for distribution to their networks. And as I said, this was very well received. In addition, in addition to our team at CIMH that, that worked on these advisories, we would have liaised with Devon Gardner, who would have been with the CARICOM Regional Task Force at the time. And another um, venture initiative we've, we've, that is fairly new to us and we've gotten into, we've, we had started air quality sampling and that is something we really want to expand on. Um, uh, we've we've started, we had started some air quality sampling. This was more preliminary using um, a high volume sampler and measuring photo suspended particulate uh, matter. We, the sampler, the high vol sampler was installed on the roof at CMH and Rebecca Chuit, um, Lucas, our research officer and Sharika Ali, who is in the applied meteorology and climatology section as a technical assistant also helped with the sampling. Actually, they did a lot of the sampling every day, changing the samplers, doing the recording, et cetera. And we did from some, we did summer 2015 right through to winter 2018. We did summer winter periods for the most part. Um, the results have to be further analyzed because we didn't have the equipment at CIMH to do it, um, the gravimetric um, weighing, et cetera. So this is something that we, we did a little bit of preliminary analysis, but we need to do some more analysis on this. But this is a relatively new thing for us, the air quality sampling, and we are really um, trying to improve our knowledge in terms of the techniques, in terms of the instrumentation to, to get further into this, this area. So in terms of the air quality sampling, we, we, the good thing about it is that the collaboration is key, especially if this is an area where we kind of, we lack the knowledge or we lack the resources and the personnel who can do it. 
So there are a number of initiatives that have come on stream or are coming on stream that are going to help us in this matter. Um, there, we had a collaboration with a Fulbright scholar who was here in Barbados um, from Shippensburg University, and he's going to be setting up a purple air sensor network, low cost sensors. We have procured um, a sniffer 4D that can be vehicle or draw mounted to do monitoring. We hope to get some more. We are working to with the University of Miami, but also to get to your monitors more than one, not just um, for Ragged Point, but also to do um, monitoring of air quality and thus inland as well, because Ragged Point is on the coast and would get the Saharan dust background. Uh, the EDM instrument at Ragged Point, placed by the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry. We've been accessing data from that as well to help with verification and monitoring. The Barbados Environmental Protection Department has been doing sampling at CAMH for a while now, and it has included particulate matter, among other things as well. And then there are other regional and international, um, or there is other regional and international data access um, that we would like to pursue, and we've started pursuing other event environmental protection departments um, or environmental departments. Uh, PAHO has had an initiative where they were doing some sampling in Barbados, and I think they've left the purple air instruments. So those are part of, would be a part of the network, other universities. Um, so the collaboration really is key in terms of trying to get these things done. So I'm gonna turn over to Ashford right now, who will be looking at the dust and air quality modeling at CMH. All right, thank you, Andrea. So we're gonna move forward and look at the the just a brief overview of the modeling work that we actually do at CI image. So if you could switch to the next slide, Andrea. Sure. So the model that we use, as you all know, is the um the Wolfchem model. And currently we use version 4.11 of the Wolfchem model is used. And our chemistry is actually initialized using the go-kart and is actually cycled daily. So the, when we produce, so for example, if we do the um, zero Z run today, when we do the um, 12 Z run later on today, we will actually use the, the forecasted 12 Z um, um, chemistry that was forecasted for the particular time period and use that to initialize the model. And models are actually initialized using GFS data at 0.25 degree resolution. And as I as mentioned, we do it at 0Z and 12Z. And we produce a seven-day forecast. And seven-day forecast because for the dust to travel across the Atlantic, it takes roughly around seven days for it to travel across the Atlantic. So we need to actually capture, capture that, that, that event from our source region. And our domain resolution is 27 kilometers, and it extends from 2 degrees south to 36 degrees north and 45 degrees east to 90 degrees west. So we are hoping to actually really expand on our domain in the future, but there are a lot of future work that we're actually, we're actually planning to do and I'll discuss it a little later when we talk. So next, Andrew. Mm -hmm. So we're just gonna look at um, two dust events that we had, at, uh, just for example, to show you how the model is actually working. So we had one dust event that was on July 10th, 2018. As you can see from the image, this was taken from the, the rooftop of the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. And you could actually see the, the poor visibility indicating that there's a, a lot of dust within the atmosphere. So the, we had a large dust event as it affected the Eastern Caribbean around July 10th, 2018. So we had initialized the simulations on July 1st, 0Z, and we cycled them through up until the 5th, 0Z, with deterministic forecast until the 12th of July, 0Z. So next, the next dust event, mm -hmm. uh, dust event 2, which, was, which took place on September 20th, 2018. And once again, as you can see, the visibility conditions at the Institute was really poor. So usually from our institute, you can actually see the shoreline and the nice blue ocean. But as you can see in this picture, you can't, can't see anything. 
So it actually shows that there is a lot of dust within the atmosphere. And similarly to the first dust event, the simulations were, in this case, initialized on September 10th, 0 Z, and cycled through September 15th, 0 Z, with deterministic forecasts ending until the 22nd, 0 Z. So next slide. So that's a quick, let's show you the experimental design. So we basically initialized from the GFS forecast and it was just cycled every 24 hours. So we started it off on the, on the 5th of July for the first dust event and went all the way through to the 10th. And similarly, we did the same thing with the second dust event, started off on September 10th and cycled it all the way through to September 15th. And basically what we found is that we were able to actually capture the dust event five days in advance, which is actually really quite good. All right, so next slide. So the data that we use uh, from, from the CIMH um, Wolfgang model outputs, we use surface dust concentration, particulate matter P, um, 2.5 and 10 surface concentrations, the aerosol optical depth, and our satellite and ground-based observations came from, came from MODIS, Aeronet, NOAA, Israel, and Global Monitoring Division, the Barbados Cloud Observatory, and also the Martinique Air Quality Observatory. So basically what we did is, is compare our model simulations with actual observations and satellite-based um, data and do a little bit of verification to actually just, just, just beyond the natural observations that we did, just to get a little verification and see how the model is actually performing and how we could actually tweak it and improve on it. Because the whole goal is really to try and improve on this model to improve the predictability. So next. So if you look at the, the simulations from the first dust event, we can actually see right in our domain, and this is actually a graphic showing us our um, domain, where we could see that we have the, we capture the source, our main source region, which is the North African continent and also part of the Middle Eastern, Middle East. So we could see large amount of dust coming off of those regions and being transported from the African continent over the, the Atlantic into the Eastern Caribbean. And we could see clearly that the, the model simulations are actually picking it, picking it up really quite well. And if you look at the total aerosol optical depth, you could see that in the resource regions, they're actually really, really high being greater than actually greater than one. And within our within our region, we could see that the the aerosol optical depth is roughly between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. Next slide, Andrea. So if you're looking at the verification of the aerosol optical depth, where we actually use the, the correlate the our observations together with the both MODIS and Aeronet from at Ragged Point, we see that the correlation between MODIS and CIMH was actually really quite high. We had a correlation coefficient of 0.987, while that of Aeronet and CIMH correlation was roughly around 0 0.9, 0 0.973. So we could see that, you know, the the correlation between the AOD, the simulated AOD, and the measured and actually satellite observation was actually really quite really high. So next slide on. So now looking at the PM 2.5 verification, where we use both Martinique and Aeronet data. So Martinique, as you know, Martinique does a lot of um, observations. So our correlation with the Martinique um, observations was a little lower, but was about 0 0.764, while that with Aeronet and CIMH had a higher correlation. So we could still see that you know, the performance was actually really quite well. So next slide. And PM10. Now we see now Martinique known was still a little low with the PM10. 
at 0.67, while that of the air net showed 0.9. So this made us, well, made me start to wonder and think, you know, why it is it you know we are getting better correlation at the Barbados site and not at the Martinique site. So since then, I've tried and do a lot of analysis and looking into the reasons of of why why it could possibly be. And one of the um, reasons I actually came up with, it could be because of the limitations with the, within the model and the actual resolution itself. Whereas Martinique, it could be that they have a, a lot more mesoscale factors that are taking place. And we are not accounting for it in our model because since our resolution is actually 27 kilometers. So next, next slide. So with the dust event two now, we can see that our um, wolf simulations are actually picking up a lot of dust off of the source region. And there's large amounts of dust coming off into the Atlantic of the African coast and being transported into the Eastern Caribbean. And it, as you can see, if you had, if you compare with the previous um, dust event, this dust event was actually much, was much, much, much larger in comparison because it was the dust haze was actually much thicker. And we could see that the aerosol optical depth in our region, right, was roughly between the same values of roughly between 0.4 and 0.6, but we had instances where the aerosol optical depth actually reached values of one and greater. And just to the north of Guyana and the east of Trinidad. So next, Andrea. So we're looking at the AOD verification with both MODIS and Aeronet. We, the MODIS actually had a higher correlation with 0.976, while that air net, the correlation kind of dropped off. And it actually kind of dropped off on the, when we take into consideration from the dust event and going after it, it kind of basically dropped off from then, as you can see from the graph here. Before that, prior to the actual dust event on the 20th, we could actually see that the values between this, the WolfCam model and, and MODIS was actually quite close. And as we came to the dust event, they had a little bit of, they were, the, the model was basically underestimating the aerosol optical depth. Whereas when, in comparison now with the, with the data from the Aeronet and Ragged Point, with the, in, during the dust event, the model, it was shown that the model was actually overestimating it, while the observations from the Aeronet network was was much low, was not much lower, but a little bit lower. Next slide. So now looking at the PM two point five and PM ten verification, and this is with with um data from only Martinique only because we didn't have any information from from the ragged points site at um, this particular, for this particular event. And we could see that, one thing we could see is that during the dust event, they actually, the, the values were actually really quite close. It was prior to the dust event where, where it wasn't close. So as a result, we had a strong positive correlation and our correlation was roughly between 0.178 for PM10 and point. 743 for PM 2.5. So we had some a little bit of improvement in, in uh, actually with the com with the comparison with the Martinique data and the CIMA simulated data for the PM 2.5 and PM 10 from this dust event in comparison to the first dust event. So next slide. So that's a summary of the model performance is that the one thing we note and we saw is that the CIMF WOFCAM is actually able to predict dust incursions over the Eastern Caribbean five days in advance. And this trend actually continued all the way to, to present. So not mentioned here, we were able to actually forecast the, the massive Godzilla uh, dust event that we had in 2020. And the CIMF WOFCAM is actually able to predict the AOD trend 
and also the PM 2.5 and PM 2. Point, and PM 10 trends. One thing I must mention here is that our model actually did really poor in the predictability of actual ozone. So, and this is this brings us, this brings me now to my next point and our next um the future where we tend to where we uh, look where we looking to go and take our uh, model. Now, um, next slide, Andrew. Next slide. Yeah. So the future developments that we have is that we are currently right now, I'm installing the DART for WARFCHEM at CIMH to actually assimilate chemistry observations, which is actually hope to help with the predictability of the of, of dust and, and air quality within the region. So I have a majority of it already installed. So now I just actually need to actually sit down and run some test cases and determine if we could run a data simulation routine operationally, because as you can see, based on what Andrea provided before, we have a lot of stakeholders that are actually um, really interested in the products that we actually output in. So we, due to our limited computing power, Right, we need to be able to come up with a with with a system with a framework that will actually work in real time and be beneficial and add value. So we just don't want to just say we're doing data simulation and then you know we can't really fulfill the mandate of actually giving um producing the forecast in real time for the national um med service within our region and also the other um, agencies that we actually collaborate with. So. Another thing that we also want to do too is actually we are looking at, we would like to increase our domain size. Because initially we started off, we had started off, when we started off, just we started off with a larger domain, but our resolution was actually much higher. So we increased the resolution. So it went down to 27 kilometers. So because of that, now we needed to decrease our domain size. So we have a little more computing power now but it's actually to find the balance now between um, your data simulation routines and the your domain size and the actual forecast length. So the for and one thing we know that can't change is that the forecast length can't change. We need it to be seven days, at least seven days in order to affect. Because one thing we have found when I was doing all those simulations before and all those test cases, right, is that when you when you um, even though we say that no, we can predict this five days in advance, right? When we just do the um simulations of five days, right? There will you you basically missing a lot of a, a lot of stuff because five days was basically like the starting point because on the day six and day seven you're still getting valuable information that could be passed on. So like so let me say sort of for those dust events that occurred on, on 20th of September, right? Even though we, we were able to forecast it on the 15th, we had an idea that those dust events will actually last for more than two days, three days, because for the, in day five, day six, and day seven, the dust will persist over the region. So this is why we need to have the, the forecast length remain seven days or even probably increase it if possible. But for me, you know, seven days is actually, we can't go less than seven days. And we're also looking to produce new products for our user community, such as vertical profiles and time series. So there's a lot of stuff that we actually have installed for 2023. But based on our schedule and our load, you know, it's going to be really hard. But we're actually really determined to actually make this happen because this is something that we're actually committed to and really would like to see true. So this is it for me, any other, any? So next I think um, you take back over from here, so Andrew. No problem, I'll just close off because in the interest of time, but basically, as we would have said, collaboration is key and we have a lot of stakeholders. We have a lot of collaborators that really, um, you know, not only that we rely on them, but they also rely on us. So. This is key to making things happen. And this would have been borne out in terms of SDS was as well. There's lots of collaboration going on there because of the initiative 
And because of what it aims to do, you're translating the research into operations and also into other information for end users and stakeholders. So basically, this is it from our end. We want to thank you for listening. This is our team. And these are the websites. We are hoping to update. We are soon going to update our Pan American Center website. So in 2023, we will be moving forward with that after the holidays. Um, but this is our team. And um, thanks to Ashford for co-presenting with me. And uh, many thanks to Rebecca, our research officer, who's done a tremendous amount of work. Dr. Farrell, our principal, David Farrell, who has been very supportive of us as well. Um, so thank you all for listening. And we were very glad and very honored to be able to share what we do with you. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Andrea. I don't know if you can open your cameras also, Ash. Great. I have here new at another chair that will chair with us the session is Santiago Vaso is is member of the I Pan Santiago. <laughs> is member of the Pan American Node. There. Yeah, and an expert in satellite products. And together with Ernest and Chair, we will chair your session. And thanks a lot for the nice talk. Um, I can see a couple of questions that uh, some of you can lunch Santiago Ernest to the speakers yeah I mean I can uh, address uh, one of them I, I guess one is from Carolyn and I'm sorry if I'm saying this incorrect it's Carolyn Scherzing <laughs> uh, but it's a good question I think uh, what is uh, I guess it addresses the point of how you share this information with stakeholders and uh, the health ministries I guess I guess that's a very important part of the yes. equation no? to make sure yes. that, that that's smooth and uh, yes. how does it work for you that is a great question and that is something that um we have been trying to figure out how to best do it the reason why we shared with the caribbean public health agency and the Pan Pan American health organization was that if the communication chain goes as we expect they would have been able to send to all of the ministries because you know you would know that the public health agency and PAHO would actually be the one to be able to contact all the ministries of health and uh, who would be able to send all the information to hospitals. But they would have been the ones to we expect to send the information to the ministries of health for us. So what we need to do is now do a postmortem to see if that was successful. Um, and if so, can we figure out how to improve it? But really and truly, it is easier and it is better. And it actually is the best protocol to send it to someone like PAHO or the Caribbean Public Health Agency so then they can send it to the ministries. So we are going to look into that to see if this can be done effectively. Um, but that is the plan. Our plan was for that information to trickle down to the health ministries and the hospitals. So we will work on that for 2023, improving that communication. Excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, and th that's interesting because in a way you need to teach the the public and the officials involved. And yes, it's a back and forth thing. Yeah, no, that's, yes, that's, that's very for cool. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, because I suppose that these uh, the national authorities who has uh, rights or 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 the legal responsibility to launch warning yes. and everything, right? Correct. Yeah. So then, any forecast now? If anything, we would advise. But then for the, in case of forecast, now we met office would put out the advisory for this, but we would just, they would use our products. So similarly there as well. Mm -hmm. The legal entity would be whomever. Yeah. Um, I think there is another second, more technical question. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure here what the context is, uh, but uh, an anonymous question is asking about the microphysics. Uh, the the microphysics used uh, for the simulation in, in those two two events, but it's it's not super clear to me. Uh, maybe one of you can address that. It's it's about the Wolf Cam simulation. It's about the Wolf Cam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I believe it's the Wolf Cam simulations. They are probably asking about the microphysics um, schemes that we use. Um, I actually can't remember the name of fan right, but I know the numbers. The numbers really great. So. Um, I apologize for that because I don't remember the numbers of and 
I don't remember the name, sorry, offhand, because there are so many numbers, but I actually use microphysics scheme four when I do my um, sim uh, sim uh, simulations with the Wolf game. So I don't know if I was able to answer that person's question. I could actually probably look up the actual name of it. If, in fact, uh, I think um, yeah. I could, um, four is, is um, Oops. Uh, just I want to mention that uh, the contacts of the speakers will be in the website together with the slides. Then maybe you can keep conversation about this technical issue if you are interested. And if this speak, if this person that is asking you, uh, because now it's anonymous for us, then uh, we will share with you the information of Ashraf and Andrea. Then There's you can actually the warp them. single moment five class scheme. I see microphysics scheme that actually used to be in use. Worth scheme, worth cam configuration, yeah. Yeah. So, and the uh, next the next question is also for you, Ash. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um yeah. yeah. So initially, right? Yeah, I saw the question, sorry. <laughs> So initially, right, we, we are going to simulate um, satellite observations first because we want to test out the assimilation scheme and use the ground-based observations to actually verify the, just to make sure you know what you're putting in and what you're simulating is, and what you're producing is actually adding value. You just don't want to just do data simulation just because you can do data simulation. Because if you know about data simulation, you know you could do data simulation, you can actually output garbage. It all depends on what you input and how you tune your system as well too. And you also, because so we need to leave back observations to actually um, help fine tune and verify the model. Because if you, if you put in everything and then using the same observation that you put in, it's kind of like cheating, all right? So I don't know if I was able to answer that question properly, but so we we using satellite information initially at first and leaving back the observations. Some of the observations actually, we actually will, will assimilate some of the observations and we're using back some of, some of them to do the verification. And once everything is fine and working, then, then we can start assimilating more of the ground-based observations as well into the model. This is the hopes, right? Uh, the next question is also about for you, Ash. Is <laughs> is asking the type of of data that you show in the slide twenty two, that is asking if it was forecast or or satellite. I'm not okay. sure what was the slide twenty two, but yeah, so slide twenty two. You want me to pull it back up? I can do that. That's not a problem. Yeah, yeah number twenty. Let me just yeah. Let me just find twenty two. Twenty two. <laughs> Yeah, those are actually, those are forecasts. Yeah, I think that was a yeah. forecast on twenty two. Yeah, the yeah. CIMH, the CIMH models are actually forecasts, and whatever I compared with is actual observations. This is twenty two. I just put up here. This will be the forecast that was on. Yeah, 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 uh -huh. yeah, yeah, on twenty two. Yeah. 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 These are the forecasts. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for you <laughs> because this was the last one in the in the chat. I don't think that in the chat there are more, but I have a question. It's about you mentioned that you want long term forecast, like up to seven days. Uh, yeah. Are you planning yeah. to use information from global forecast models like uh, NASA Geos, uh, NASA, NASA Geos, or NSEP, or even Copernicus data because they are providing you forecast for five days? And I would like to know if you have experience to compare the forecast to these five, six days with these global models in comparison with your work cam run. Well, actually, I, um, I'm actually going to, right now, in the short term, the plan is to just really kind of 
help more develop our model. But right now, under I don't have, I do not have any plans to actually input um data from those models right now. That was not actually in my plan, right? So I probably could modify it as I go along. Because this model, this whole model and team is just basically mirroring. So and I'm actually quite overwhelmed with a lot of other stuff as well. So I'm just doing as much as I could possibly do at the point in time. Yeah. So there's actually for me, there was actually no plan to actually use data from those models into our models. More than just the regular inputs from the, the regular GFS and stuff like that, and then do our simulation and stuff like that. But there's a I always we always I always compare what I what our models produce with what they produce as well. Mm -hmm. I always do this in the background. I yeah, I was going to, yeah, I was going to jump in and, group, right? and say that we do that. We actually do the comparison. And when it was the Godzilla right. event, one of August um, graduate students, he did a lot of the analysis for that. So that helped us. And um, um, Jose, Le, and Jose Le did a lot of comparison because what we did for that um, Godzilla event when we had the field campaign is that we were all, we had a group together with the NASA, at least it was the NASA Geos 5 and us, right? Ashford, it was anybody else. I think it was at least the two of us with Pete, yeah. Pete Calarco. So we yeah. actually were doing comparisons of how NASA Geos 5 did for that event and what yeah, we did. They, well, they, at least for the, the campaign for, for 2020 and 2021, that's what we did. As well, right? so. Yeah, yeah. So we were looking my, at my comparisons of how they did. Yeah. yeah, my question is more related to why you need to do seven days of forecast if you oh, have right. global models that can give you like three, five days. Then in this in this context of you know of long long step forecast, uh, there is a clear degradation in your forecast with respect to global models, or is quite uh, similar. Well, it is the, my question will be it, it is an improvement to use regional models at seven days in comparison uh, to global. Yes, there was there's actually improvement for us. There uh -huh. was actually improvement for us. All right. Uh -huh. So this is the whole reason why we actually started up doing this. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh -huh. This is interesting, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Angela Benedetti is around, that is from the Copernicus, and I think that someone from NASA is also around, then take note <laughs> that it looks like someone from NASA are better. Um, I don't know if there is any other question in the room, but in yeah, the... There, 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 there are two more. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one about um, advisories for mineral or ash. We do do volcanic ash modeling. Yeah. There's a, there is a master's student who was working on that. Ashford worked with her as well. Yeah. I don't know if he wanted to jump in and say anything else. Um, yeah. Are you going to see what the other question here? The... Okay, yeah. But she actually did, she actually did um, ash, um, the volcanic ash modeling. And um, it was very useful because of the fact that she actually, uh, the, the stakeholders, the Met services actually did rely on our volcanic ash modeling. And it was it came in very important for the last two fair eruption. Luckily, we had already, she had already started doing this modeling before that eruption, right, Ashford? She was able to capture. Yes, yes. And, and was able to look at, yeah, she at the deposition. She was actually doing something theoretical. And yes, she was actually doing something theoretical. Yeah, we didn't have any real volcanic eruptions at first. And then mm -hmm. during the time she was working on her ash modeling for her and, and her master's thesis, we had the last two free eruption. So it worked out, it came up to be, it ended up being extremely useful. The um, model seemed to perform pretty well in terms of looking at the slope coming back over the islands and the amount oh. of deposition we got in Barbados. Um, yeah, so it, was, it ended it up was being a really new. useful, yeah. yeah was really good it was pretty good and um it was able to predict that deposition and and so on so it really was useful so that's something we are looking into as well i didn't mention it in my talk because of the dust aspect we were focusing on but i i i, I was to still say a little bit about it yeah we do plan to push that some more as well 
And the other question asking if, if um there's predictability out of mm. week or 10 days, right? So from our simulations, right, for the same dust events that we were talking about earlier on, you we were actually seeing that the dust would, was coming over, but the locations of the dust was actually incorrect. So I would say that the predictability from seven to 10 days, I don't think it, it actually varies from, from one event to the other. Because with dust event two, right? Dust event two, the predictability from seven days out, you will actually see that you will have this massive dust event coming over the Eastern Caribbean. But with dust event one now, we wasn't seeing it at seven days. We started seeing it at five days. So it it would it it would depends on the actual system as well, too. So that's basically how I'll answer that question. Now we have never done a 10 day forecast, so I have I can't answer for 10 days. It's four o'clock. Time to close. <laughs> We are super on time, like British people, closing at on time. Thanks a lot, again, Andrea and Ashford, for the time that you dedicate us. Thanks a lot, Santiago and Ernest, for sharing with me this, maybe my last webinar. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Next year, you will have different chairs for this series of webinars, but we have very interesting speakers. Then I will introduce the then the next webinar if you don't mind. Oops, here. Remember that we have this nice website where you can gather the previous webinars. Also, the Andrea Nash uh, webinar will be here in the Das Barcelona in the Barcelona Das Regional Center website. This nice website. Oops, sorry my music and the webinars are in this section of resources that uh, you can see here that is the webinar of today but also past webinars and also if you go to the event section you will see here the upcoming events and also the webinar that we have planned for uh, next month that is in January or invited a speaker is Vasilis Amiridis from the National Observatory of Athens. The webinar will be Wednesday, again, at 3, Central European time, one hour less UTC. And it will be 18th January. And Vasilis, that is an expert in measurements in remote sensing techniques, will overview the results of this ASCOS campaign that took, a, took place in Cabo Verde last year in between summer and autumn. Then the registration is open. You will find all the details in the website. If you go to, oops, to the website, you can see here the calendar, the registration, everything. And remember, if you want to follow us, all the activities and everything that we are doing through the regional center, remember that we have a nice newsletter. Then if you subscribe to the newsletter, you can receive all the news and updates that we will share with the community. And um, with it, it's everything from my side. Just I want to thank again all of you for being here today, for the chairing the session and for handling the session. And uh, yeah, my pleasure, always. Then have a nice Christmas. We probably, if you subscribe to the newsletter, you will receive a very a nice Merry Christmas from the WMO Dash Regional Center. Then subscribe. And um, this is everything, right? Yeah. See you around next year. And yeah, happy, happy New Year. Yeah. Thanks and happy thanks holidays. And take care. Happy holidays. Thank everyone. you. Take care. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks a lot for, for the Bye. talk. Bye. Bye. Bye.